All right, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for coming to this lovely venue uh, for Westmont Downtown. As I think probably all of you here know, Westmont Downtown is actually two entities, uh, a faculty lecture series that has been going on for, for several years, and more recently, uh, a growing downtown campus. Uh, I'm executive director of Westmont Downtown, so it's great to be able to host this event and have you with us this evening. Uh, we weren't sure what the, what the sun and shadows were going to do on the venue here, but I think it should work out pretty well. So uh, let me introduce uh, the other Rick, Rick Ifland, uh, who will uh, get our event started here this evening. So, Rick. Well, I feel like I'm talking to family because I think I know everybody in the, in the crowd. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Michael Schossberger, who's just an amazing person. I think most of you know his, his background. Um, and so maybe I won't belabor that point because there's family and friends that are here and we all know where he went to school and what he does for Westmont. Um, but I wanna share with you something that's really important to me. And it's just fun that Sarah's here as well because she was a classmate of my children, and I was 2,000 miles away when the tea fire broke out. And my son was one of the two seniors that were in the front of the gym, and I was on the phone with him, and his job was really to protect, especially the younger um, classmen who were there if they need to go to the bathroom or whatnot, to not be able to see what was going on outside. And I remember him, I said, well, how are things? And his comment to me was, Dad, I think it's going to get us. Because he could see the fire coming down the hill, just physically see it. Um, and everybody else is kind of locked in the gym. And as a dad, that does something to you where you feel just so helpless. So we were talking to him throughout the night, and of course, everybody's abandoned off campus. And the next time I heard from him was the next day, and he was at the Schossberger's house. And I heard noise in the background and people having fun, and it just seemed like he was very well adjusted to his new surroundings. And so um, Michael is an amazing musician, an amazing um, director, conductor. He's just been an amazing person for uh, our college. We're gonna, we're gonna miss him, but we do wish him well in his retirement, which is so well deserved. But as a dad, I just want to thank you because my anxiety went way down when I knew that my child was in the Schossberger's home and being taken care of. So thank you. We do look forward to your talk on the performing arts and in a time of COVID and what all of that means. I wish this were a packed house because um, I think that everyone would benefit from hearing you. So, Michael, thank you for all you do, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Schossberger. I, I, the number was somewhere between 17 and 25 uh, cross-country athletes that wound up on our floors <laughs> for a few days or a week uh, in, that, in that moment. But you know, it's just one of those things like COVID or the T fire, you just roll with it. You make it work somehow. And that's kind of what the purpose of this talk is about this evening. I expected more non-musicians who were seeking answers. How did they do that? But it looks like we have a lot of musicians here going, yeah, what's he gonna say? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so here's the thing. It was late, and this is, you know this story perhaps already, but perhaps a few of you don't. Uh, late in 2020, the Westmont Orchestra had just completed a beautiful tour of Northern California. We had hiked in Yosemite. We had played for three senior living centers uh, live. We had been in three major worship services. We'd done two evening concerts uh, in, in public settings. We'd done three uh, high school uh, clinics with the orchestras in the same room playing for each other. And of course, the 50, 60 of us rode in the same bus together, uh, you know, unmasked, who thought of that, uh, you know, for, for a week. And we unloaded the bus and went right into rehearsals for the opera, uh, which was held just down the way at uh, the New Vic Theater. And we performed live to a packed house in, the, in that setting. And then everything stopped. Uh, that, that very next week, the world just shut down. And that was uh, 
difficult, uh, difficult to understand, difficult to anticipate, and, and to cope with. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about, is where we went from end of a wonderful live living tour with live audiences and interactions and even in senior citizen centers uh, to being completely locked out of the art and craft that, that we know and that is so essential for the performers and also that we realize is so essential for the people that we perform for and with. It's a, it's a mutual experience when you do that. It's a, it's a part of your soul, who you are as an individual, what you offer to the world. And we know that it creates a, a bond and a meaning to the people that receive it that is so critical. That's why these entities are there and why every culture throughout world history, as far as we know, has always had music, has always had people singing uh, close together and in person, and has relied on that for an essential form of communication. Uh, all that to say, we all know also that the costs and the implications of this pandemic have been incredible in so many other fields as well. Uh, healthcare, the foremost of those, with people's actual lives on, and online and being lost. And we don't mean to compare the loss of performing arts or the challenges in performing arts with the challenges in the healthcare system or the challenges in public transportation or, or any other field. But tonight, we're just looking at this one aspect uh, of the implication on our culture and our society of that. So that's what we'll focus on without comparisons or apologies uh, for the differences. But we know that there's a human condition that was deeply affected in multiple ways. Careers were changed, lives were altered. Uh, people's ability to respond to their own conditions was affected by this. They weren't able to be lifted up or connected in ways that they normally were. And so here we are. And the first thing that we all looked at each other and said in that one week, if you recall, at Westmont at least, it was, we're going to start a week late. You know, we're going to give this one week to blow over while we figure out how to make this work. So, okay, we'll go online for a week. And, we, you know, so what are those first reactions of what do you do now? And so, you know, visually, I always like to bring some visual aids. Um, you know, the first reaction was a quickly homespun, you know, mask with little elastic things that my lovely wife made for us. And the next thing were some rather sophisticated homemade masks that really, really fit, you know, and look really good that you could put musical fabric on. And then we got our first Westmont demos. Uh, this was from Germany, uh, our sample performance masks, which turned into, a month or so later, the official Westmont performance mask. And now, of course, we're far beyond that, and we're all the way to N95s, so, you know, we have we have these in abundance now stacked up. So that's just a progression of masking. But um, you know, what happened first of all was people's quick reaction to this. How do we keep something alive and how do we communicate uh, what we can be? And these, you know, a range of wit and whimsy. And the first one, and by the way, I got to credit to Aaron Sizer, who's gonna be my technical assistant this evening. Uh, you, and, and also credit the Old Town Antique Store. Please patronize Old Town Antiques because they're sharing their Wi-Fi so that this presentation can be held this evening. So stop by there and, and thank them. Buy a, I don't know, an old lamp or something as you go out. Uh, uh, and we're, we're really running the risk of uh, the, the technical limitations of the space right now before it gets fully tricked out by Rick, I'm sure, in the coming months and, and years. Um, so wit and whimsy and attempts at making something happen, this was my personal favorite. Now you may already know all of these and have seen them yourselves by YouTube uh, wanderings that you made. But uh, this is a, a British family that tried their very best uh, to express their musical creativity uh, through example number one there, if you wouldn't mind hearing. Aaron had to be over there because it was a better Wi-Fi signal. <laughs>
Thank you, Aaron. That's good. <laughs> the, the spirit of the family coming through. Uh, you know, a, another approach that um, emerged right away was the idea of, well, we can connect virtually. And so this idea of virtual choirs and virtual orchestras appeared where individual performers would create their own part of a piece and then we would merge it digitally uh, so that there was a, an effect of that. And these were done with, uh, I mean, elementary schools, junior high schools, worldwide efforts were done. Uh, there's an Eric Whitaker virtual choir with something like 100,000 singers involved. But we were right out the gate with this. I want to say that we had this done within the first couple of weeks. And here's our, our first effort from the Westmont College Choir singing Aaron Copeland's The Promise of Living. Of course, we had the piano track uh, recorded in advance, and so the singers could sing with that. Uh, that's great, Aaron, thank you. Great Brothers, who's here, also did one of those with the choral union singers, and uh, we had various ensembles build out from that. The orchestra did a uh, Simple Gifts of Aaron Copeland as well, and we had uh, all those presentations set out because we lost all of our uh, concerts at the end of that uh, semester. So they had to have some uh, summation experience, and yeah, it was virtual. That's it. But these really got sophisticated too, and people put a lot of money into the production of these uh, and did some amazing work. One of my personal favorites is this uh, Spanish portrayal of Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, which we'll let it go for a while because it's so varied and so rich. Uh, and you see the images of the cathedral in Seville there, it's astounding. This is in the time when singers weren't allowed to appear in public. Uh, the violins could get away with it, but uh, they had to distance the singers and put them in a, in a virtual phase. Uh, then we had this time of, uh, and Aaron, if you want to set the next one up, it's going to go to 1407 is the time to start on that next video, uh, where we were trying so desperately to create live and authentic rehearsals so that at some point we could perform together or even to create a, a basis for doing the virtual performances. And the big challenge is the delay uh, that happens over the internet. So if we're talking about milliseconds sometimes, but milliseconds is death uh, to coordinated music. You'll, you're on the wrong chord. You know, you're just not together. Uh, so we, tr we tried lots of different ways and consulted all over the country, really all over the world, to find solutions for 
the solution to this uh, asynchronous problem that happens over Zoom or over Skype or any other digital media. It's just the time for that electronic signal to travel is enough to be incredibly annoying uh, to musical performers. And so there were lots of people that thought they had solutions and lots of labs around the world that thought they had solved it, but guess what, they still haven't. But there was one solution, a very intricate procedure from a studio in New York that had developed this, pro this, this process even before COVID came to rehearse with casts who had come to Broadway from all over the country. So you'd have a, a tenor coming from Seattle and an alto coming from Louisiana and a soprano coming from Minnesota. And they'd only have a few days before the show would open and they wouldn't have much rehearsal time. So they developed this real-time music solutions platform where the director would be able to send out a signal to all of the performers. All the performers would then be able to patch into that with a soundboard uh, to control all the different uh, signals coming in. And the director would hear them because they would all be buffered through this system. He would hear them together so that the actual conductor would be hearing them synchronously. Uh, and they would be hearing a feedback to themselves of the director's con to this was all It was all intentionally delayed. So it would work because they were controlling the delays and the feedbacks to everyone. It was a marvelous idea, and I'll let them explain it a little bit. I will say that it was a total failure for Westmont <laughs> because uh, we had people coming from all over the country in various capacities of technical expertise and various qualities of equipment so that our, our singers or our instrumentalists would come at it with a, you know, an old microphone or a new microphone or an old computer or a bad Wi-Fi signal or intermittent Wi-Fi and it was, we spent two-thirds of our rehearsal time trying to debug the tech and just a little bit of actually making music. But it was a fascinating concept that we'll share with you uh, from Real Time Music Solutions. And I will credit the uh, creators of this. They really tried <laughs> to, to help us get through this. But here's, here's a bit of how that worked. And lastly, we have the mix of you. The name says it all. But we believe it stands alone in the world of video conferencing. Here, you can mute, adjust panning, and mix the relative volumes of the voices and underlying accompaniments. And with that said, I will now present a demo of the multi-participant rehearsal live share. Once again, you'll see and hear our wannabe singer staff, Stephen David, now joined by Ellen Warner and yours truly, directed by David Smith. Okay, so I'm just gonna start. We're gonna go for it. So they say. <laughs> but the real wonderful advantage of that was the conductor could mute three of the singers and just listen to the one. So you could really pick up errors and, and hear what an individual was doing unbeknownst to them. They weren't singled out as you say, um, Steve, just would you do that by yourself, please, in front of the entire orchestra to make sure you have that right? You could just take the rest of the orchestra out and listen to Steve. And it was really kind of fun when it worked. It really didn't work <laughs> very much. Uh, probably limited to three or four Broadway singers to make that effective, but our, our students were noble in trying to download the latest version every week and, and all those good things uh, to try to find some way to work together. That was in the fall uh, of 2020, now by the time we'd gotten to something that sophisticated. Uh, another approach that uh, we took was to create environments for live performance and to move into video uh, sharing. So. Uh, 
to put the concerts out on video that we had created in these sort of environments of safety. Uh, Nicole DeShane and I uh, opened up that series uh, with a duet recital, a duet recital with Neil DiMaggio, uh, placed at various points in Dean Chapel with all the windows open and fans blowing on us out just in case any of us had any connection to anything. And of course the video crew being far at the other end of the building, outside on the patio, uh, to you know, create all these spaces, and then put the video out. Now we did, I think by a rough count, something like 36 uh, video performances in that year of 2021, trying to make one every week during the academic year. And we got better at it and the conditions changed under which we could produce them. But this was our, our first attempt at this uh, solo chamber uh, performance with open windows and open hearts and open fans. But uh, the, a third approach um, to this, which was really exciting and, and a kind of a wonderful uh, gathering of the international arts community was this an effort that was headed out of the University of Colorado to get all the science underneath the, the aerosol dispersion and all the issues that, that were going on uh, to try to, to come to some way of making things work. So the American League of American Orchestras, the uh, American Choral Directors Association, the National Association of Teachers of Singing, uh, even the Barbershop Society uh, for Barbershop Quartet Singing participated in the funding of these studies uh, to try to figure out how far the aerosol dispersions went from a singer, where they came out uh, from a clarinet, what direction they went when you played the flute, uh, to do all these things to figure out what is it that we could do to sort of work together and, and create ways of safety, to create shields, to put on masks, to, to find out what the distancing was necessary to be safe and all this. So a little bit about that study, uh, which has really, even is continuing today, but in the first two, three, six, eight months, it, you know, weekly updates from this consortium to anybody who wanted to access it, and it was a wonderful source for us to say, we've learned by the science that we can do this, that this kind of distancing is appropriate, this kind of space uh, to help people work together. So I think that's what we're on now in the video. Sorry, we got out of order there. And that was the effort that was going on. You can see even in the clarinet demonstration there where he had a little mask on the clarinet itself. Uh, so we 
tried those two at Westmont, and it just turned out that uh, those little masks, because uh, music, of course, travels on sound waves that are at a certain amplitude in space and in the air, and it just so happened that the masks every now and then eliminate those tones <laughs> so that you could be playing a scale and the mask would be personally sized, per perfectly sized to eliminate all B flats, for instance, from the clarinet section. So they'd be playing along, go da da da. Ah, da, 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 and you wouldn't have that middle da, and to have the note in there. Or that they would make the trumpets horribly flat because they would, they would depreciate the, the amplitude of the sound. So uh, very bizarre things. But there were lots of creative um, solutions here. And Aaron's got a few of those lined up. One of my favorites was the bassoon mask. <laughs> Now, perhaps my, my second favorite was the incredibly ingenious high school director from up in Washington State who said, well, if we need to mask, let's just mask the whole unit and get over this spatial thing and provided individual performance spaces for each of his jazz band members. Uh, this really is one of my very favorite things in the whole era. concern around singing uh, with a mask off and we wanted to make sure that our students had both the ability to sing and play an instrument uh, in groups so that they could practice together and it was extremely important for us to, to figure out a way to, to make that happen and so uh, their creative approach is kind of where we landed on this and then in collaboration with our local health district uh, we were able to, to pull this together and, and get approval and uh, here we are today. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> so, so one of the big challenges here, of course, is creating a space where they, people can hear each other uh, and also can play in proximity. Uh, the 12 feet between performers uh, model is one that works if you've got an incredible amount of space and not so many performers, uh, especially if you're indoors. It doesn't work so well with symphony orchestras or large choruses. Uh, so at, at Westmont, we had the great opportunity uh, to be outdoors. I think this is just uh, outdoor choirs outdoors in masks at 10.05. This is the uh, Roanoke Children's Choirs from Roanoke, Virginia, uh, who attempted the ultimate in outdoor expression here. I think this is just a wonderful uh, look at that, at this video at, at 10.05, Aaron, if you can find that. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. And then we have um, Westmont's own outdoor cathedral uh, that, that we created so that we could perform Gabriel Fauré's Requiem. Now, if you missed that performance, oh, that's because you weren't invited. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we couldn't have anyone there. Uh, but it uh, really made use of, I think, uh, what a stadium is ultimately meant to be used for. Notice especially the use of the authentic, actual pipe organ, which was built for this occasion uh, in the stands at the Westmont track. You'll see that coming up here. And uh, so let's go ahead and cut ahead and look a little bit. And then we had this next iteration of combining possibilities. And this uh, was a wonderfully creative and collaborative effort across our uh, whole musical community at Westmont. Many of you were involved in that and were even in it uh, <laughs> to some degree, but our Christmas festival, where we realized that we could have the orchestra 
indoors because the string players weren't emitting any aerosols and the winds could all be masked appropriately and distanced in our large Simmons room in the Global Leadership Center. But the choirs were not yet allowed indoors. So how to get the choirs and orchestras singing together uh, and performing together. Uh, so we did it through the little bit of the digital magic of having the orchestra pre-record in one space and the choirs record with them with a digital feed of the orchestra playing for the conductor behind them so that the conductors could conduct the orchestra, apparently, which had already been recorded. And we could have multiple choirs performing in the same place at different times and load them on top of each other. On our Christmas video, I don't know if you, have, if you happen to see it, it's really quite lovely. It's still up on our uh, Westmont uh, Music Department website if that video doesn't work today. But my favorite moment in the Christmas video was when Neil DiMaggio is playing an accompaniment for one of the choirs, and it is a piece for four hands piano, so that you would typically have two pianists sitting at the piano, one side playing the bass and one side playing the treble. And just for a flashing moment, uh, you can see all four of Neil's hands uh, doing that as he played track one and then played track two and then the video laid them over each other. So all four of Neil's hands are there on the thing. But this is just a little uh, snippet of this. If you could do the Christmas at 5157, Aaron, that would be a highlight of the orchestras and the choirs together uh, performing. This is about 120 musicians all performing uh, at the same time in close proximity to each other, just not at the same time <laughs> or in the same place. But check out the Westmont Music Department website and if you haven't seen the Christmas video already, watch it again, it's beautiful. And uh, watch for Neil's hands, but especially go to about 50 minutes in and you can see this incredible collaboration of people that were nowhere near each other uh, but managed to be a part of that. Now the next, next couple of video images are simpler, I think we'll load instantly. Uh, these are our efforts at Westmont to continue to work together and to make music live. And we are, of course, blessed with Santa Barbara weather and with the good graces of our very supportive administration to help us find solutions to these problems, one of which was to create what we called affectionately the Big Top Tent, uh, which was somewhat larger than a basketball field. And the first photo of that, I think, Aaron, is that on, your, uh, on the chart there? Our, our uh, little snippet of the men singing together, spaced that delicate 12 feet apart with their masks on outdoors in a fully open tent. <laughs> so imagine how you can hear each other, how well you can hear each other there, and how well you can hear yourself uh, to make that sound. The next picture is a lovely picture of the orchestra in process in the twilight, uh, making, making their music uh, as they're able to under the big top. Well, professional sports teams led the way to the next generation of making things work together. If you can remember, especially the uh, baseball season, which started so late in the spring of 21, because they hadn't figured out yet how to, how to play together safely. And all of those pictures inside the stadiums of people's cardboard cutouts of people cheering for such uh, performers that had gone through this process, and the basket NBA did this as well, of creating bubbles of safety so that people were heavily screened before they could actually walk into the room to work together. And we tried that. Yes, we were right there with NBA and ahead of baseball uh, doing that in January with the Westmont Opera. And all the students had to be tested on the way into rehearsal and throughout the week as we worked together. And then we also separated them into pods of working energy so that the understudies were in one pod and the leads were in one pod and the chorus were split into two pods. So should the lead pod go down because they were in close proximity and having to learn how to dance together in choreography, the understudies would not be impacted until the very last minute of the performance uh, when they could come together. Now, did this work? Yes, uh, it really did. It was it's really quite impressive that our leading tenor uh, tested positive on the opening day and so was immediately pulled from all activities and no one else tested positive uh, throughout the process uh, of, the, of the entire opera. So we, we knew we had the walls built in the right way and, and could work through it. Now, every time anybody sniffled or you know, had a slight headache, they were sidelined and had to be tested immediately and out for 48 hours. And, but the tent allowed us to keep them on the outskirts watching and observing while they learned. So I do have the next, it's another Vimeo, so it probably won't work. Uh, but we did have a little bit of the opera that we performed not as a live performance, but rather as a movie set in a black box theater at the center stage just here downtown, uh, where we could bring in just enough performers for each scene and limit the exposure to the performers themselves, cut everybody out of the theater for 20 minutes, refresh the air, come back in, next scene, 
with exact the number of formats that were needed to do it, cut everybody out, uh, and make the production happen in a way that a, that a movie would be run or a, or a TV series would be run with limited exposure to each other and very controlled environments. Uh, doing Don Setti's The Elixir of Love in that regard. And there is one moment when the chorus comes on stage full that one of our chorus members forgets that they can take their mask off when they come on stage. And so there is one moment of one masked singer, otherwise you wouldn't know. Uh, but they were, of course, they had their masks in their pockets, but they had to put on as soon as they got past the curtain line. And that was the, the drill of keeping the pods safe and then also limiting exposure. Uh, you can see there is a wonderfully excited audience uh, to watching this show at the heart of the video. If you watch the um, Elixir of Love, again, it's on the website for Westmont College Music Department, uh, which the audience is filmed is the orchestra uh, that was filmed without their instruments clapping vigorously at the end. <laughs> so you could, you could see that happen. I don't know if we do have a, a minute to show some of the opening of that. The director does a very nice job of explaining this process if the video does load for us, Aaron. Welcome to this production of Gaetano Donizetti's Lesir d'Amour, or The Elixir of Love. We're so glad you have joined us for this video presentation. <laughs> Here we are. Well, we were experiencing in real time together this afternoon you, uh, part of the challenges, <laughs> which was our dependence on technology. Of course, that choice made because of the worldwide COVID pandemic. And how we've come to be able to make this production is a virtual story in itself that we're happy to share a bit of, although we'll let your imaginations run as to how extensive and prolonged some of these different contingencies really are. We began this production by casting in the fall, and we didn't know quite then yet how we might present it, so we waited and learned and listened and watched and carefully planned for each new contingency and each new change of season. Eventually, we determined that filming and presenting this as a completely video experience was the proper and most efficacious thing to do in this season. And so, orchestra, the cast, the crew, Members of the theater and everyone associated with the actual production went into one of those very intense bubbles, those kind that we have heard of for professional athletics and for collegiate athletics as well. And we shared with our colleagues at Westmont who had to do these kinds of in-person programming in the same way, with a high degree of discipline, conscientiousness, and care toward each member of the cast and each part of the production. Regular testing, recurring contact tracing, and being very careful with day-to-day -day changes of cast, crew, orchestra, and staff to create what you will see as a live performance. Interesting aspects of staging include perhaps more dis Well, you get the idea from the video of how we introduced it. Uh, thank you, Aaron, that'll be fine. Uh, but we did create the dances so that the um, dancers were at least six feet apart. Uh, and we had them all with uh, some sort of pole extension, whether it was their saber for the soldiers or the parasol for some of the ladies, that would help them keep that six foot distance between them as they moved and danced and choreographed all that into it. Uh, but just a few months later, the orchestra was able to do a performance in that same space with a limited audience of screen participants. And so we could take those steps toward making live music together. Uh, and so we just go through this revolving door of variance now and surges and, and reactions to what we did. But we know more than we did at the outset. And we know more about transmission and how much to deal with it and how to deal with it in certain ways, uh, to isolate possible carriers, to uh, be flexible in programming so that if one performer goes out, the whole performance doesn't go out, uh, to make sure we have understudies, to uh, pick repertoire that's sensitive to this. 
uh, so that uh, we're not just totally reliant on one performer's health in that moment, but can easily move back and forth and, and have some skillful flexibility in that, that sort of way. Uh, Stand-ins work, and we seem to all be living sort of on the razor's edge uh, constantly in our performing possibilities. There's still a lot more emphasis on recorded performances. I think we all learned how to record more effectively, uh, how to, to, to develop the technology to do that, and the resources to do it now are much more uh, available to musicians. Music Academy of the West was entirely virtual last summer, and they gave about a $1,200 package of uh, studio recording equipment to every one of their fellows instead of bringing them to Santa Barbara to make live music so that they were able to create their own product and create in collaboration with others. And we're still you know, realizing the effect of this on us as a culture. Uh, many, many opera companies and symphony orchestras have gone bankrupt and gone out of business uh, so that there has been a real economic effect and real practical effect on groups, entities, and individual musicians. Uh, we saw our music scholarship applications fall by half uh, last year, uh, and our uh, male singer applications fall by 90 percent. Uh, and why, one asks, might that have happened? Well, at that particular point in a high school student's career, uh, it is a major decision-making point of, will I continue with this in college? Same is true in athletics. So when they walk in the door of their junior year saying, I think I'll keep playing trumpet, and there is no trumpet to play, and no place to play it, and no one who will teach them, uh, it's a place going, well, maybe I'll do something else, or I just will put it down. And they, in large part, didn't have the support needed to continue. We heard many stories of students saying, oh, I would have auditioned, but I didn't have any teacher to help me make a recording, or I didn't have any instruction to go on to learn the repertoire that is required for auditions. And so those numbers fell precipitously, especially in the case of male voices, where at the age of 14 or 15, the male voice has just settled from its change and needs a place to begin. Typically, that would be in a high school musical production or in a high school choir or in a church setting where people are singing together corporately. None of that happened for a year and a half and none of those singers were nurtured or developed or inspired or brought along. And so there was nothing to continue with or move forward. And so we're just trying now to recover from some of that uh, impact and activity. Uh, that pipeline hopefully will open up again as those things happen. Many individual musicians were affected. I was just talking with Aaron Oldman this afternoon, our viola professor, uh, who said he was a couple of weeks away from going into computer coding. Uh, when things started to return in the studios where he makes most of his uh, financial uh, support and doing uh, recordings for movies and, and television shows. But he said he knows many, many friends who have taken that route, have gone into things that they can do outside music, and that has absorbed them now, and they're no longer active professionally in the area. And that's not an uncommon story that we have heard. But who knows? Next month, the Westmont Orchestra is scheduled to tour Salzburg, Vienna, and Prague, the tour that we canceled in 2020. Uh, there are ways to do it now. There are N95 masks, a plenty when there were none. Uh, there are vaccinations that uh, the orchestra now has to have in order to even get on the plane or to, to get out of the plane in Germany. Uh, there are all kinds of possibilities of testing along the way and, and care that's being done. The tour will cost us $50 more per person uh, for the testing to get back into the United States. And uh, there is that specter of staying an extra 10 days in Prague alone in a hotel room if you happen to test positive on the day of departure. <laughs> so they all know that. But those are the challenges, and we have the largest tour group ever uh, headed out <clears throat> on that trip. I think there's a lot of optimism, a lot of hope, and a lot of sense of loss uh, of what has been and hope that we can recover some of it as we go on. Uh, and also we have the issues not just of herd immunity, uh, perhaps, but of herd acceptance of coming back to the arts. Uh, we, had, we did see, thankfully, full Granada theaters for the Christmas program, live and in person at Christmas. But that's not a totally typical reaction of audiences today, as many are still hesitant to come into theaters and to be locked in a box uh, for an hour or two uh, with people they don't know and perhaps don't trust uh, in terms of their own health. Uh, so those questions are still out there. Will the audiences completely return? Will the ensembles completely return you know, with the same sense of vigor and freedom that they have in the past? But I think one thing that we know is it's well established is that performers will be undaunted in such challenges, whether it's individual camping tents or outdoors in, in the middle of wide open fields. 
and that it is incredibly important to our culture and our thriving as human beings to continue to express, to continue to hear, to continue to relate to each other in artistic ways, in expressive ways. People often ask all of us musicians, what does it mean? What does that piece mean? Or what is, what is, being what is the story behind this? Or, or what is that music about? And you can only do that to a certain extent because at some point the reason there is the music is because it carries its own meaning and its own depth. If it could be expressed in prose or in speech, Beethoven wouldn't have had to write it. But Beethoven had to write it because it surpasses the content of what we know as speech or prose. Poetry tries the same thing uh, and it succeeds in the same way. And you can't always explain a poem because a poem is what the poem is and says what it has to say because that's how it can be expressed. And we know music does the same thing. So we've got to keep trying. We have to keep finding those solutions. And somehow, even in an age of COVID, even when technology fails us uh, to, to tell the story, to make the expression, and to keep going. I'm certainly appreciative to everyone who's come alongside this effort, to our incredible faculty who have taught for over a year now in tents, uh, sometimes outdoors in the wind and in the cold, to our musicians who keep showing up. Uh, I don't think we've lost many student musicians to this in incredibly overlaid and extra added endeavor of making music in this age of COVID. They keep coming up and keep showing up. Uh, to try to, over, to overcome this moment, uh, to the administration that has supported us in technology and in spaces, in moving the tents around campus, in believing in the studies that have come out, and everybody who's, in who's been involved with in this endeavor has been involved in taking the risks that have come with it. Uh, will I show up to rehearsal and knowing that could affect my life for the next 10 days or two weeks or longer? Uh, will I allow this music program, as in the case of Wenatchee High School, to have a jazz band in camping tents? The, the principal and the superintendent had to say, let's try this. Let's risk, let's take that risk. And, and our colleagues at Westmont did the same with our big top tents and our ordering our masks and, and allowing the experiments to go on as we stayed within the informed circle of care and concern and, and hygiene and all those things that went along with this, with this moment. So may it pass soon. But if it doesn't, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about ourselves, a lot about our culture, a lot about the nature of performing, the limitations, uh, the fragility of it all, and then sometimes because of that, all the more about the importance and the necessity of what we do. So that's making music in the age of COVID and with uh, the technical challenges that we had today are very representative of the things that we worked with uh, throughout the time in the last year and a half that we've made this struggle. So thanks for coming. I know many of you were a part of the effort and now we have time for Q&A too, but thank you. Please. Yes. Thank you, and you know, I, was, I was so pleased we could do that and that it worked so well. And it was at the same time too that many major um, companies in the world were really making great efforts to bridge those gaps and to reach people. Uh, Vienna State Opera, New York Metropolitan Opera all made their programs available for two or three months for free. Uh, their live performances, which are pricey uh, to, to make and, and to share. So there were a lot of efforts in that regard, but I'm glad ours was helpful in reaching that. Some of you lived the same things, have other comments, other observations, uh, please. Uh, and Caleb, I agree, I completely agree. Uh, that's an important observation, thank you, thank you. Other questions or things you'd like to share to add into the, to the telling the story, Aaron. I, I do think that the increased capacity for technological sharing and collaboration won't go away. Uh, the RMS Music Solutions uh, crew has made great strides in that, but I think many individual musicians are doing so much more video work and sharing it so much more broadly. I am impressed that, for instance, uh, the recital that Nicole and I did that we couldn't show a bit today, uh, had we given that in Dean Chapel, 40 to 60 people would have come and filled the room. It has had over a thousand views on Vimeo, so we know that we expanded our audiences to an incredible degree uh, by putting all those 
performances out. Now it's expensive to do it. There are all kinds of legal hassles in doing it legitimately and licensing and they expire and that's messy. Uh, but we're still doing it to the extent that we can and other entities are as well. So I think we've really jumped ahead. Not that the virtual or the, or the, the technological sharing will eliminate the necessity for individual live performances, but they will be an additive. I can get to my daughter's performances in Cleveland much more easily now than I could have pre-COVID. I'd still like to see her do it live, uh, but at least I can see what I can of, of that, of that um, videoed performance. And more people are paying attention to that, more people are doing it, and it's becoming more available through almost every major uh, distribution and, and, and performance entity. Yeah, Please, Rick. As I said, there are, there are major companies that have gone out of business, that, that, that went bankrupt, uh, and there are many school programs that disappeared uh, for a time, and some of them are gone. Uh, some of them are simply not being refunded at this point in time. Some in the Santa Barbara area are near that place, um, but others are just trying to restart. And of course, they're restarting with much less. Again, like our music auditions you know, being so far down the last two years, they're starting from scratch in building the program that will then generate those auditions. So, so we're very much in favor of the Santa Barbara Youth Symphony. I've, I've just noted sort of anecdotally is probably about a third the size it was at the beginning of the, of the pandemic cycle. Uh, and those are the kind of impacts I think that are not uncommon uh, throughout, throughout lots of programs. But a lot of people tried to innovate, and a lot of, like the Roanoke Children's Choir and the Wenatchee High School Jazz Band. <laughs> lots of people were out there trying to keep it alive and trying to make it work, and that, those efforts will pay off. They'll, 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 they'll keep coming. I did talk to one student who said he did, uh, had quit playing the trombone because virtual lessons were virtually worthless, is more of his comment. <laughs> yes, please. What settings are you, is your orchestra playing in, in your career? Is it going to be held? Um, you know, the, right now, the, the status in Austria and the Czech Republic is that concert halls are open that they are very, very strict on vaccination uh, screening and health screening. But, the, but things are open, so we are, we are playing in a very modern concert hall in Salzburg because the Mozarteum, where we were supposed to play, is uh, closed for renovation. And then we are playing in the Royal Palace at the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna. Well, just a spectacularly beautiful 18th century hall. We're also playing for the Vienna School for the Blind. And we're also playing um, worship service on Sunday morning at the Holy Trinity Church in Vienna, which is the church where Beethoven's um, memorial service was held, and where Schubert wrote the liturgy for the Sunday service. And we're playing it. We're playing Schubert's service in the context of Schubert's service there uh, for that church. And then we're playing probably the jewel of the crown and the finale, which I'm so thrilled for the possibility of. Uh, we're playing at Dvorak Hall at the Rodolfium in Prague, which is just one of the most classically beautiful major concert halls in Europe. It's really, really gorgeous. So those are our settings, if, if all goes as planned. Yes? Well, a couple of comments, one about the Christmas concert. Uh, I don't know if I told you this. We took our neighbors, uh -huh. and uh, they uh, live right next to us, but don't know the restaurant very well, and they were amazed when I told them just a few exceptions, all the people were students. And then they guessed we must have had, we must have 5,000 students yeah. because of the quality. And that leads to a second comment that I shared with the previous provost. I don't think I've shared with the current provost, but I hope the current provost will relay it to the future provost. And that is, um, if you want to get a high quality student body that's diverse, um, Increase the music scholarships. Athletic scholarships, those students work hard, but they tend mostly to major in kinesiology, maybe become business. Music scholars, they major in everything. And the person that's grown up learning to play the violin has a certain amount of intellectual discipline that's really in sync with what we try to do at Westmont. Second quote to that is Michael, you, you're, you're uh, it's just going to be a big hole to fill, and your, your ministry. Has just been incredible. So thank you so much for all you're doing. 
Oh, you're very welcome, and it's, been, it's all joy, and I'm really excited about the folks that are coming. Uh, we have wonderful stories to tell about our, our two new colleagues, uh, Gray Brothers and I both retiring this season. Uh, we have uh, uh, Siegwart Reichwald uh, coming from uh, Converse University in uh, South Carolina, and he's a Mendelssohn, internationally renowned Mendelssohn scholar uh, to take on musicology and the worship uh, aspect of the Adams Chair. And then we have Dr. Ruth Lin uh, coming uh, in orchestral studies, and she's a wonderful conductor with uh, incredible training through Northwestern University and 14 years of collegiate experience, coming from uh, a very fine uh, college in Minnesota, Gustavus Adolphus uh, College in southern Minnesota, St. Peter, and she's really, really excited about being with us, and I'm, I'm really encouraged. She's asking all the right questions at this point. <laughs> How does that work? Where does it go? How do we do it next? So they're going to be great people, and I'm certainly, I've told both of them that I'm going to be in any time they need help to be on hand to help them. Well, <laughs> well if you count Daniel G, there's actually three. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. That was a nice intimate gathering. I'm so glad you could all be here. And a special thanks to Doug for getting it all on camera so somebody can see it in the future, and to Aaron for being our technical wizard, uh, for burning everything on the side. <laughs>